to introduce our first speaker, uh, Liza Landsman, um, and uh, recently named the president of Jet.com. Uh, Liza um, uh, leads the company's management committee and is a member of Walmart's US e-commerce leadership team. Uh, prior to joining Jet.com, she was chief marketing officer and a member of the executive committee at E-Trade Financial. She's also a Cornell alum and the mom to Sarah and Hank. So we're thrilled to have her. Welcome. <laughs> I just realized that Hank would be really pissed off that he got second billing to his little sister, so uh, <laughs> don't tweet that. Um, so before we leap into this, uh, how many people here have heard of Jet.com? OK, good, 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 thank you. How many people have shopped at Jet.com? All right, thank you for your business, and the rest of you, get on it. It's free shipping over $35, so start today. All right, um, I was really excited to be invited to speak at this conference except for one thing, and this may be the one time in my life that I compare myself to George Bush. You know how George Bush could not pronounce nuclear ever? Um, I can't really say, I'm gonna try it, entrepreneur. It is a word that's really hard for me, so it's gonna come up a bunch of times during my spiel and just like be kind, okay? <laughs> All right, um, so the typical sort of entrepreneurial story that we love in this country, almost as much as we love the story of a boy and his dog, is the story of like a couple of boys in a garage, right? That is the bootstrapping, I don't know, those of you, I was a, went to Cornell undergrad, I had these boots but taller and uglier. Um, and so when I think of bootstrapping, this is what comes to mind, right? We love, love, the story of the boot, I'm gonna move over here because I'm blinded by the light, literally, right? The, we love the story of sweat equity and very small seed capital and you know people kind of like working through creating a green shoot and then figuring out how to scale and that is a wonderful, wonderful story. I love those stories. I am not here to tell you that kind of entrepreneurial story. Oh, I said it, um, right? Um, I am here to tell you actually the opposite kind of entrepreneurial story. And there's no moral to the story other than open your mind about what being an entrepreneur, entrepre ah. <laughs> open your mind to being what kind, that kind of person <laughs> can mean because um, it is all about operating in the context that you are, that you're sort of focused on. Okay, so Jet, um, is an e-commerce company, and this is not here to represent a jet, so wait for it, it's something else. Um, it, uh, but one of the things that's really important to understand about e-commerce sort of in context setting is that it is not for the faint of heart. And I was actually just talking with one of the corporate sponsors just beforehand about the, you know, sort of what is going on in retail right now, and it is very, very expensive to operate an e-commerce company. Right, in, in part because sort of consumers have moved there. Depending on whose data you like, um, you know, brick and mortar retail is growing anywhere between two and five percent a year, depending on whose data you like. E-commerce growing hmm, 12 to 15 percent a year, but within that, marketplaces, which are multi-product lines, right? Um, are 22, 25%. They're driving a huge part of that growth. Um, and one of the other consumer phenomena is that north of 50% of all product searches on the web now start on a marketplace. They don't start on Google. And so with the rush of volume into those spaces has come this huge increase in what consumer expectation is for the experience. And with expectations comes expense. Do you have great customer service? Do you have a scalable website? Do you have high quality goods? Do you have great people working there who continue to build your technology? Can you afford the technology that your infrastructure is built on? And so if you are going to, here's where it comes up, if you are going to escape the gravitational pull of the immensity of the fixed costs that you have to hold if you're gonna be in this space, you gotta have a lot of fuel, right? And so again, going back to the 
there are lots of different kinds of entrepreneurship. That typical story you hear of small seed round um, and growing a sapling is the opposite of what we did at JET. So just to put this in context, um, in June of 2014, we raised about $55 million uh, in our sort of seed slash A round from NEA and Excel. Um, we had not launched yet. In February of 2015, we raised an additional $125 million um, from Bain Capital and from some strategics like Google Ventures. We had not launched yet. Um, I joined just around that time, um, and we launched in July of that year, July of 2015, um, and we did our formal next round in November um, of that year, where we raised an additional, just, you know, round number, $618 million of capital, so effectively raised about $800 million in capital over the first 18 months of our existence, um, which is about the amount of wood you need if you're going to start a bonfire that's going to be visible around the planet, um, which, was really, which was really our goal. Um, and that is, we were not trying to grow a sapling. We were trying to pull a sequoia out of the ground with our bare hands. Um, and so what does that really mean? Right? It is about thinking about scale in a different way from day one. It is about not launching in a single category, as Amazon did 22, 23 years ago, but launching in 1,436 categories from day one. It is not thinking about launching in a particular market, um, as many other organizations do, but launching nationally. It is not about thinking about, oh, there's one channel that is the ideal channel for us to start. It is about launching on four platforms across the country with national television supporting this out of the ground so that we could get to critical mass, so that we could reach that escape velocity so much faster. Um, before, I, Does anyone recognize this? No, I'm the only one who had no friends in middle school. OK, <laughs> it's fine. I accept it. Um, so this is an illustration from the young adult book, uh, A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline LaEngle. Um, if you have kids that age, it's a great series. You should read it. Um, it is a drawing that is her representation of a tesseract. Now, in, in the real world, tesseract is a term from geometry that basically represents uh, a fourth dimension around a cube. So a tesseract is to a cube what a cube is to a square. Um, but the way they explain it in the book is really about thinking of time as a fourth dimension. And, that, um, and this is something you know, almost every startup wants to be able to do, which is figure out how to bend the space-time continuum in a way that is advantageous to your use of capital. And the way uh, this illustration explained it was that the typical way of thinking about movement through space is that the, straightest dis the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, which is that ant that's walking across that piece of fabric that's pulled taut. And the thought from this book is actually, well, the straightest distance between those two points is if you can actually bend the fabric, in this case, bend the fabric of time and space and reduce the distance between those points. Um, and so effectively, the choice we made um, very early on was to figure out a way through a different use of capital to bend the space-time continuum. So we took the capital that we had raised um, in that round in June and said, instead of figuring out a way to make sure we you know, could have as long a burn time frame as possible, what if we dramatically compressed our spend to try and achieve the growth we hope to get to in 12 to 8 months? and try and get there, sorry, 12 to 18 months, and try and get there in six to nine months instead. 
right? And everything that you have ever been taught about the conservation of cash and capital, all of which is true, um, would you know, rise up at a cellular level in your body and say, you should not do that. That seems very crazy. Um, but in fact, our thought, because again, come back to those fixed costs, our burn rate on fixed costs was, pretty, was steady and growing as the organization grew and as our consumer base grew. Um, and we realized that by stimulating a higher, like a higher hockey stick, a faster hockey stick on growth from a top line sales and consumer penetration perspective, when we next went out to raise money, we could do so at a much higher valuation because of the inherent value of the company and the greater cash we were gonna have on hand because of our fixed. So this is the way that we attempted to sort of bend the space-time continuum at JET. So how did we do? Uh, so we come out of the gate, we have this big launch, which um, I mentioned, and about 11 weeks after launch, we got to a million members, which put us right between Spotify and Instagram in terms of speed to hitting that mark, which is, you know, generally speaking, pretty good company to be in. Um, and it was great on a host of fronts for us. Certainly, it gave us a lot of credibility in the investor market. It gave us a lot more kind of visibility with consumers, and it was great, you know, if you think about our value equation, our relationships with brands and e-tailers um, and suppliers, like having access to that volume so quickly was a good sort of good housekeeping sale of approval. But the most important thing it actually did for us is because of the scale we had in our consumer base, it allowed us to understand uh, a challenge in our business model that I think it would have taken a normal company several years to get to, which is when we launched, we came out of the gate with uh, a value proposition that said, we're gonna suck all these costs out of supply chain, we're gonna pass all of them back on to the consumer, but you're gonna pay us a membership fee in exchange for the access to these discounts. And we had this working hypothesis that we needed to provide 10 to 15% better prices than you could get elsewhere on the internet in order to get that consumer uptake. And we were gonna pass all of that savings back on to the consumer but since our investors actually expected a return, we're like, well, we'll have to charge a fee because that's how we'll make money. Um, what we discovered, because we had so much scale so quickly, is that in tranches of consumers where the actual discounts they were getting were less than that 10 to 15%, we're in the 5 to 10% range, our conversion rates and therefore our cost of acquiring customers were still extremely compelling, much more compelling than we thought they would be, and that scale and volume allowed us to, to test really quickly and do some confirmatory experimentation to say, we actually, we don't have to charge a fee. Consumers are interested enough in this in the five to 10% range. We can scale our business much faster. And so that quick scale and access to data allowed us to pivot our business model 11 weeks after launch, which is something we would never have been able to do if we were sort of still bootstrapping our way into a small consumer base. And one of the lessons we learned early on um, was really understanding what those key accelerators of growth are. Um, and so a couple of lessons here um, that I thought would be useful to share. One is really thinking about hiring ahead. So if you want to run a business that is gonna have a $50 million p and and part of it in six months, don't put people in charge of it that can only run a $5 million business. If you want to scale a platform so that it can support $5 billion in volume or 100 million simultaneous transactions, don't build something that won't scale that way. Um, because think about, so I joined uh, Jet in early 2015. I was around employee 100. We got acquired uh, in August, September of 2016 for $3.3 billion, we were 300, we were 3,000 employees by then, right? Just think about the, the tax on the system, given the big jumps we made in scale, if every time we had grown sort of a, a quantum leap, we'd had to replace managers and sort of upgrade our talent. So we really hired ahead, um, and I think it's a critical step in achieving that growth. One of the other things, though, that um, was critical in achieving growth 
was thinking about the right combination of organic, which is mostly what I've talked about, but inorganic growth. Um, it's very funny. I did not put up here. There's a version of this like fish eating fish one that has the little fish with a bubble over its head that says the world is an unjust place. And the middle fish has one that says the world is occasionally a just place. And the big fish says the world is just right. Um, and well, so we acquired a company in February of uh, 2016, so probably about six or seven months before we ourselves got acquired. Uh, it's Hay Needle. It's a pure play online home goods e-tailer. Um, and the notion there was to think about not just, oh, how do you acquire that chunk of revenue, but how do you accelerate your growth in terms of your expertise, your relationships with brands, how to bring people into the organization who had sort of seen some of these movies before um, as a way to really create a step function in the growth of the business. And that strategy has continued on um, post even our own acquisition with acquisitions of companies in sort of related verticals like Mod Cloth and Bonobos and Moose Jaw and I always forget one, shoe, shoe buy. Um, and that too is a different kind of accelerator of growth and a way to get to scale very swiftly. Um, but it's interesting. Um, so I spent most of my career, I did one other startup before Jet and it's when Hank, my 19 year old was two. So it was a long time ago. Um, but I spent most of my life in big public, big public companies, a decade at Citigroup, chunk of years at IBM, um, at BlackRock, and you know, BlackRock runs more money than the GDP of Germany. Um, here's the thing that is kind of uh, really interesting about coming into Walmart, uh, because you know, the metaphor I have in terms of like what is the greatest accelerator of scale, um, we are part of the world's largest company. So Walmart, if it were a country, would have the 20, world's 25th highest GDP. Um, during the time we are talking, because it is the month of November, where Walmart sells two pumpkin pies per second, almost 2,400 pumpkin pies have been sold in Walmart. They sell a billion pounds of bananas a year, a billion. Just wrap your head around that. 900 million pounds of potatoes. I don't, that's like a massive carbo load. Uh, and, you know, 90% of the population of the US lives within 10 miles of a Walmart. When Walmart uh, lowers its prices, the world gets a raise. It is a you know, wave whose top is so high you cannot see it. Um, and it is an incredible thing to be a part of when you are an organization that is obsessed with scale and critical mass. Um, and so those assets, the almost 12,000 stores and the 240 million people who walk into a Walmart every week have been incredible enablers for us as we think about sort of the next chapter as we load for bear, right? Um, in being part of the Fortune One, which is actually just sort of this chapter of retail's great scrappy underdog um, in the fight for consumer hearts and minds in retail and e-commerce today. Thanks for your time and go Big Red.